We're talking today with Don Kiefer of Colorado Springs, Colorado. The interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project, and we're conducting this interview at the 2015 Ripcord Reunion. Okay, now Don, can you start us off with some background on yourself? And to begin with, where and when were you born? I was born in Delta, Colorado, 1948, December 20. Okay, now where in Colorado is that? That's on the western slope, um, about middle of the state. Okay, uh, and did you grow up there or did you move around? No, uh, I don't even remember that. We moved mm -hmm. from there when I was quite young. I uh, lived on a farm near uh, Fort Morgan, Colorado, which is on the plains, mm -hmm. for uh, a couple of years. And then when I was in first grade, we moved to Colorado Springs and lived there until I was drafted. Okay, and what did your family do for a living when you were growing up? My father worked construction, mostly as a painter. Mm -hmm. and my mother always stayed at home. Okay. Uh, and then, did you finish high school? I did. I finished high school and I went uh, two years of college. And where did you go to college? Uh, down in Phillips University for two years, uh, well, two and a half years of college. And then uh, I transferred to University of Colorado, Colorado Springs ended up getting drafted out of there. Okay, now, um, did you get drafted because you didn't have enough credits or GPA or...? Yeah, the, um, when I transferred to the University of Colorado, I enrolled and uh, been going to school for a while and they told me that I didn't have quite enough credits to be a full-time student and therefore I didn't have a student deferment. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, and so when do you have to report then? I finished out the semester and, and reported then. Okay, and so? That was in um, February of 70. 70, okay. Uh, now, when you did the induction process and so forth, did they give you a physical as part of that? Yes. Okay, and where did they do that? That was in Denver. Okay. And when you went to the physical, did you notice anybody trying to scam the system or find a way to get out, or were you all cooperating? Uh, we were all cooperating. Uh, I did happen to find out after I took the physical that if I weighed five pounds less, I wouldn't have been accepted. <laughs> all right. How much did you know about the Vietnam War at the time you got drafted? Well, going to college, it was a hot topic, so mm -hmm. I knew a fair amount about what was going on. Uh, I was aware of the Gulf of Tonkin and uh, the different regimes that uh, were the South Vietnamese government. Mm -hmm. All right. And did you have an opinion about the war itself, or is that just something you're going to have to do? Um, I didn't agree with it at all. Um, I was drafted and I decided, well, maybe I'll go to Canada instead of going in because I didn't agree with the war, mm -hmm. but that didn't work out and I ended up being in inducted. Okay. And where do you go for basic training? Fort Lewis. Okay. That's in Washington State. That's in Washington, yes. All right. Um, how did they get you up there? Uh, Lotus is on a bus uh, from the induction center when, where they gave us the physical, uh, took the, the oath, and then they loaded us on a bus and set you, us up there. You drove all the way from Colorado yeah. up to Washington in a bus? Yes. Okay, how long did that take? I don't remember. Seemed like forever. Yeah, <laughs> probably. <laughs> all right. Uh, and what kind of reception do you get when you arrive? Well, we got there. Uh, I think it was like 2 o'clock in the morning, and it was, uh, okay, you're here, this is what you're going to do. And just very matter-of-fact routine. Okay. So there wasn't at that point any yelling or other things like that? No. Okay. So you're not at Fort Knox. All right. Because they do things differently in different places. So that little more laid back here on the West Coast. Okay. Um, so do they give you just a place to sleep, and then things start the next morning? Yeah. The... Uh, I don't really remember. They, they must have had us sleep somewhere that night. And then the next morning was when we really started in the, the routine of okay. induction. 
And then what kind of processing do you have to go through there? I did a lot of testing. Uh, I tried to score good on everything but outdoor stuff, and that didn't work. Mm -hmm. So I ended up in the infantry, but uh, yeah, and then we got the uniforms and all the clothing. And two sizes, too big, too small. Now the guys you came up with on the bus, did you all sort of stay together in your training company? Yes. Okay, so a lot of you were from the same area then? Yeah. Okay. And were most of you draftees? Were there enlistees or other people there? I don't remember any enlistees. There probably were, but I don't remember mm -hmm. them. Okay. Most of us were draftees. All right. And what was the actual basic training itself like? What did that consist of? Uh, a lot of PT. Uh, you know, map reading, basic uh, rifle skills, um, UMC, UMCJ. So, yeah. Court of, Court of Military Justice. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, just the basic stuff. Okay, and then how about the discipline part, the spit and polish? Yeah, there was that. Uh, get up at O'Dark Hundred for no reason at all, go outside and stand in formation. And clean up the barracks after it was clean, that sort of thing. Okay. And how easy or hard was it for you to adjust to Army life? Uh, it was, physically it was okay, because mm -hmm. I was in pretty good shape when I was, was drafted. Mentally I had trouble getting around the, okay, these people are running my life. Mm -hmm. So that gave me some trouble, but it wasn't too bad. Okay. And sort of how long did it take for you to kind of sort of figure out your, your system or how to get by? Probably a couple of weeks was all. Okay. Now were there other people who were having a lot more trouble than you were? Uh, yeah. There was one guy in particular who just could not get it. And uh, he went on to infantry training with us and I hope he didn't go over to Vietnam because he wouldn't have made it. He just could not get it. Was it just couldn't follow orders or couldn't tell left from right or? Yeah, he just like, you know, assembling the VM-16 after it was taken apart, he just could not figure it out. All right. Uh, now, how long was the basic training? Basic training, I think, was eight weeks, maybe nine, but I think eight yeah, weeks. Eight, eight is fairly standard, at least for the training itself. Okay. Yeah. Uh, now, by the time you're done with that, do you know what they're going to do with you? Do you have an assignment for what happens next? Uh, after basic training, yeah. uh, well, we graduated from basic. They marched across the street to um, infantry training. Okay. Were there some guys who went other places? or There were. Okay. But most of you were just going on for infantry training? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and that's also done at Fort Lewis, so you're there. Uh, how was infantry training different from basic? It was focused mostly on, on combat stuff. Uh, we did the uh, bayonet training, more rifle, uh, M79, WAS, all, all the different weapons, M60, and uh, escape and evasion, of course, map reading. Can you explain how the escape and evasion training worked? What did they do for that? Oh, that was a joke. Uh, they uh, took us out, told us we had to get to the other side of these woods where they had, uh, you know, trainers in there searching for us. And all we had to do was get to the other side. And I was, uh, as a kid, you know, I was a Boy Scout up in the mountains all the time, mm -hmm. outside a lot, camping a lot. It was simple for me. Okay. Uh, did some of the guys get caught? Sure. Some of them got caught. Okay. Not too many, though. All right. Uh, how much of an effort were they making to simulate conditions in Vietnam? They did uh, some pretty good stuff there. They had a, an area that they called Cheeseburger Hill set up. We were supposed to assault it, and they had booby traps and... Uh, you know, people with uh, rifles firing blanks and mm -hmm. stuff. Um, they had a, a range where they had people out in the field and we were just supposed to try and spot them. 
they, they did a pretty good job of setting it up. Okay. And the people who were training you, did any of them have experience in Vietnam? Almost all of them did. And did they talk at all about that, or they just went through, did, or they just did their business? Mostly they did their business. Um, occasionally somebody would say, you know, this, this may be hard for you now, but it's going to save your life when you're in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, did you get um, time off? Could you go in, in, into town or anything like that from there once you were in AIT? Uh, yeah. Um, we, we had a three-day pass after basic. And AIT, I think, once or twice we got to go into town. Did you go to Tacoma or Seattle? or Tacoma. Okay. And what was there to do there? Nothing. Okay, well, drink. We, we just, yeah, went to the bars. And... Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, now, after that, um, is Vietnam the next stop, or what happens next? Yeah, I had 30-day leave mm -hmm. and then uh, overseas replacement and on to Vietnam. Okay, and where do you ship out from? So, uh, Port Louis. Okay, uh, and what's the process of getting into Vietnam? Uh, well, we got there, went to the overseas replacement station, uh, big barracks, lots of people, take a number, get a haircut, and wait. And uh, eventually had all your baggage checked, and put on a plane, and went over to Vietnam. Were they using commercial jets for this, or yes? Okay, and did you? What route did you take to get to Vietnam? Uh, I think we stopped at Clark in Japan. I think it is. Clark is in the Philippines. Philippines. They're, they're, they're okay. in a base in Japan too. Clark. Clark it was. <coughs> mm -hmm. So it must have been the Philippines. Yeah. Often when they come out of Seattle, they go to Alaska and Japan and down that way, but. You don't recall doing it that way? No, we didn't go to Alaska. Okay. All right. You stopped in the Philippines instead. Okay. And where do you land in Vietnam? That was at uh, Cameron Bay. Okay. Did you come in during the day or at night? Middle of the day. Okay. And what's your first impression of Vietnam? It was hot. Stepped off the air conditioning plane and into the heat, and I said, whoa. Okay. And what do they do with you once you get off the plane? Um... They assigned us to, uh, I'm not sure what they called it, it was an in-country orientation. Yep. And I think that lasted about a week, okay. maybe a little longer. And what were they having you do during that time? Just go to classes and learn the do's and don'ts of what we were supposed to do. Okay. Were they trying to teach you anything about the Vietnamese themselves or the, the society? Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they did some that, uh, you know, they weren't the gooks and, you know, don't do not do like this to them, because that's a rude gesture. That sort of thing. That sort of thing. All right. Uh, do you do any patrolling or bunker guard or anything like that? Not not at that time, no. Okay. And are they just kind of getting used to the weather, maybe? or? Yeah, it was hard. Uh, first day I was there, I was wandering around, heard air raid sirens. Didn't know what it was for. Nobody seemed to be paying any attention. Later, I found out it was an air raid siren for incoming mortars. Mm -hmm. But it was a big base and it wasn't anywhere close to us. All right. Uh, at what point do you find out where you're going? Uh, that's at the uh, replacement station, in country replacement station. Mm -hmm. And uh, we got there and didn't know where we were going when we got there, but everybody says, yeah, 101st is taking a beating. They're going to need a lot of replacements. And I said, yeah, I know where I'm going then. Mm -hmm. And I, I was. Okay. Uh, and where were they based at that time? 101st. Uh, 101st. They were in Camp Evans, mm -hmm. the, the I-Corps area. Yeah. Okay, so it's up, up, far, up in the north there. Right. Uh, okay, and how did they get you up there? They flew us, I think they flew us to Hawaii, mm -hmm. and then from there we uh, went by truck. Mm -hmm. Okay, and when did you arrive at Camp Evans? Camp Evans, I got there on uh, somewhere between the 13th and the 15th. Of what month? July. Of July of 1970. Yeah, yeah I okay. arrived in country July 1st. 
All right. And was your company in the field at that time? They were. Okay. And for the record, what company did you join? That was Alpha Company, second oh. of the 506. Okay. And they're out there in the field. So um, now when you get, so there's a company area, though, at Camp Evans. So you yes. go there, and now what happens? Uh, we got all the equipment we needed for to go out to the field, uh, weapons, uh, ponchos, poncho liner, all that kind of stuff, um, all the munitions, the M60 rounds, hand grenades, trip flares, claymores, mm -hmm. and uh, Top Ross, our first sergeant, wanted us to get a get on a helicopter, go to Ripcord, and then from Ripcord to the company. Mm -hmm. There was um, a guy there who had been out in the field. I don't know what he was back for, but he was going out again. He kept telling us we don't want to go to Ripcord. I was listening to him. Okay. <laughs> I didn't want to go to Ripcord if he didn't want to. Did you know what Ripcord was yet? Yes. Uh, I knew it was a fire support base. I wasn't sure just exactly what a fire support base was, but I knew it was some outpost out in mm -hmm. the jungle that was getting a beating. Okay, because by then the enemy were already bombarding the place on a fairly yeah. regular basis. Right. Okay, so what winds up happening then? Uh, we get on, on the 18th, uh, we get on the chopper for resupply and go out and join the company in the field there. Okay, and the Describe sort of the trip and your arrival with the company. Oh, the trip, uh, for most of it, uh, it was really nice, uh, really beautiful green jungle. And, uh, we almost get there and uh, 51 caliber starts firing at the helicopter. So that kind of changed my mind about how nice it was. Okay. Uh, now, did you have an LZ that you could go into? Yes, there was an LZ there. And uh, they'd uh, cut it out, chopped out the, the brush and everything. And I was expecting there to be shooting since they were shooting at the chopper. Mm -hmm. I jumped out, pack went over my head, and I fell on my face. And that was welcome to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. All right. And what kind of reception do you get in the company at that point? Uh, well, I'd, I'd cut my chin when I, when I fell. They looked at it and they says, well, he'll be okay. Well, he's a keeper. And they assigned me to a platoon and nobody would talk to me. Okay. And which platoon were you in? Second platoon. And who was your platoon leader at that point? That was Lee. Lee okay. uh, Widgescott. Widgescott. Okay. Uh, and so you join them. And now what's going on now? Once you join them, what do you wind up doing? Uh, we move up. I didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. We mm -hmm. you know, set up somewhere move, and then uh, spend the day there, send out some patrols, which I never went on because I was so new, and then uh, nightfall, we'd move again, spend the night, stay up for uh, guard duty. Okay. Now, at this point, was the company operating together or were the platoons operating separately? No, they were together. Okay. And who was your company commander? That was uh, Captain Hawkins. All right. And did you get much of an impression of him in the first few days, or was he off somewhere else? He, I don't think I ever met him when, when I was in the field. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, now, you get there at a point in time when the fighting on and around Ripcord is kind of getting up to the climax. I mean, July 18th is the date when the helicopter crashed on the base, right. blew up one of the artillery batteries, and that was kind of the beginning and the end. But you guys are down there in the field, and the company up to that point had done fairly well, but things then get uglier pretty quickly, or at least that's the official version. So what's happening with you? You join the company, you start patrolling around, what things start to happen? Um, well, uh, like I said, I didn't go out on any of the patrols or anything. Mm -hmm. uh, one day, you know, the... Uh, squad leader comes up to me and says, uh, we found a comm line, we're tapping it. And, you know, we'd just flown over 20 minutes of uninhabited jungle. I'm thinking, yeah, let's jerk the new guy around. Mm -hmm. And then uh, a day or two after that, he says, yeah, the, we saw 
tall blonde guy with the, the Vietnamese and the captain shot him but he got away and I'm mm -hmm. thinking, of course he got away because mm -hmm. I didn't believe that either and it turns out they were both true but uh, yeah I just didn't know what was going on um, I think every day you could hear gunfire and, and whatnot uh, nighttime a couple of times we were within sight of the or my position was inside of the uh, fire base, and mm -hmm. I could see all the, the munitions going off there. I just kind of accepted that as, you know, well, it's, it's a war, and that's how things are. Now, were you assigned to kind of follow a particular person around, or did you have someone who was looking after you, or were you just going around where the CP was, or just stay with the squad? Or uh, I stayed with the squad. When mm -hmm. I got there, uh, I was introduced to the people mm -hmm. whom I don't remember who they were anymore and just did what I was told. Okay. Uh, now, after they find the comm wire and you're, you're there for a while listening to it and so forth, uh, eventually North Vietnamese start to zero in on where you are. Right. Okay. And a pretty big firefight starts to develop. And what do you remember about that? I don't remember that at all. Okay. Um, I remember, the only firefights I remember was the one on the 22nd and... Uh, well, the 22nd was the big one. Yeah. And the, uh, I remember a couple of guys were on OP and at the uh, stream where they shot the, uh, the two guys. Mm -hmm. Both, that's the only two I remember. Right. Um, so what do you remember about the one on the 22nd? Oh, the 22nd? Yeah. Uh, that one is... Uh, I remember we were... We were supposed to be... 2nd Platoon was supposed to be the last one out. And that they had started to leave and came back. I didn't know why at the time. And... Uh, seemed like we were there a long time, which apparently we were. Mm -hmm. And then we were the point platoon and headed out. <clears throat> so uh, I was near the end of the platoon when we were leaving. And before we got all the way down off the hill, uh, I guess the point was off the hill and, and on, but I was still on it. When they told us, you know, stop, we've got, you know, movement. And then the shooting started. Um, I was shot within the first five minutes mm -hmm. in the arm. And uh, we uh, stayed there for a while. And then it was word came back that we were going to move forward and, and join a defensive position on up the trail from where I was. Mm -hmm. So we did that. Uh, so you could walk at this point. You're hitting the arm, but you could yeah, still walk. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was actually a really minor wound. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it didn't slow me down or anything. Okay. Uh, the uh, we had to go down through a draw and back up a hill, a little hillock, and the uh, sergeant told me, "Okay, he says I want you to run down through this and up the hill because there's a machine gun that's been firing down the valley." the going. And I said, okay. So I run down there watching where my feet are going so I don't trip, get down to the gully, and I see two paths going off. I'm not sure which way to go. And I froze. Fortunately, there was no gunfire. And somebody ran past me and I followed him up the hill. Uh, after I got up to with the rest of the platoon, uh, Somebody, I'm thinking it was probably Lee, told me, get in this position over here and get out as far as you can and shoot anything that moves. Mm -hmm. So I crawled out as far as I could and they started shooting me and I backed up a little bit and used up almost all my ammo there. Okay. And could you see anything to shoot at? Uh, mostly, uh, it was... Uh, you know, muzzle flashes yeah. I could see yeah. every once in a while. Uh, 
the, the grass moving around, I could see. Uh, once uh, some guy threw a, stood up and threw a grenade at us. That was that was the only time I actually saw somebody. Mm -hmm. And were there other men from your platoon go close enough that you knew where they were? Yeah, the uh, M60 was right next to me on my mm -hmm. right. All right. Uh, and how long did that fight go on? Do you think? I remember it lasting six hours, mm -hmm. and it was. Uh, getting dark before we went back and joined the company. Okay. Now, did things quiet down toward dark so you could move, or did you have to withdraw with the enemy still shooting no, at you? No, it, uh, it quieted down. Um, when the guy threw the grenade, it uh, landed really close to me, and mm -hmm. for a long time I couldn't hear anything. And when we finally got together and, and moved back, mostly all I could hear was loud buzzing. Mm -hmm. And when somebody spoke to me, I had to ask them to repeat it and watch their lips so I could figure out what they were saying. All right. And then what was that night like? Because you were stuck out in the field that night. Yeah. Uh, we got back up there. There were bodies all over that hill. And uh, I was told what position I was going to go to. And there, were, there was a sergeant and one other guy, probably PFC, and we started digging in and dug a good position there and stayed up all night. Mm -hmm. Now, were you getting um, support overnight, whether illumination or air or anything else? Yeah, there were, uh, there were gunships uh, around the area and flare ships that uh, kept circling overhead. Uh, we had a uh, strobe light set up in the center of our position. And did you have a sense of what condition the company was in at that point? And how badly hurt you were? Or? Um, I, I knew there were a lot of badly wounded guys, and uh, I know I didn't see anybody who hadn't been wounded. Mm -hmm. So I, I figured we were pretty beat up. Mm -hmm. But your wound wasn't, you could still use your weapon though. You, you were sure, able to fight sure. and that kind of thing. So you were better off than a lot of them were at that point. Yeah. All right, uh, and okay. So what? Basically, did the enemy attack you during the night, or did they leave you alone? They left us alone. Um, I heard reports that uh, the gunships could see flashlights moving around in the jungle and, and whatnot. But uh, as far as I know, we never had any contact. Okay, and then what happens the next day? The next day uh, was uh, body detail. I had uh, I was part of that detail and went around pulling all the bodies up to the top of the hill. Mm -hmm. uh, once everybody was accounted for, I counted and they were over on the one side, stacked up like cordwood, mm -hmm. and I counted uh, thirteen bodies there. And then it was. Uh, back to perimeter guard until Delta Company came up. Okay. Now from where you were, could you see or hear what was going on with the ripcord evacuation? Because there were lots of helicopters going in and out. There were more helicopters than I knew existed. Yeah. Okay. And do you remember hooking up with, with Delta Company? Yeah. Uh, actually, they came up right where I was in my position on the perimeter. And um, five, ten minutes before they actually got there, somebody came up to me and says, you know, we've got Delta Company coming in, don't shoot them. So we were expecting them. Okay. And why did you need them to come in? Uh, because we didn't have the manpower to build an LZ. Okay. So you had to cut a new LZ to get out because everything else was so hot or... Yeah, uh, yeah, the helicopters couldn't land the way it was. They had to blow the trees and, and build a, a pad for them. Mm -hmm. All right. And now you have to take the men out in sequence because they're, they're, they're using Hueys or whatever, the smaller right. helicopters to lift them out, so only a handful of men at a time. Uh, where were you in the sequence in terms of getting out? 
Uh, I was fairly early. I'm not sure just you know how many choppers. Well, first they had in one or two medevacs mm -hmm. to get some of them the more wounded out. Yeah. And then, uh, um, well, there were there were two bodies and three men on each chopper. Mm -hmm. So I was with a chopper with two bodies, so mm -hmm. that should have been like within the first six choppers. Yep. All right. Uh, and then how long does it take to get back to Camp Evans from there? 15, 20 minutes. Yeah. And what, was it, what happens now once you get back? Uh, well, landed on the, we, we picked up all the equipment we could carry. I happened to have a radio and I got out and somebody from uh, communications grabs a radio from mm -hmm. me and I turn around to head back to the, uh, the company and all along that edge of the field there were, the guys were lined up cheering for us. Mm -hmm. That, yeah. that didn't make much of an impression at the time. I didn't know why they were there, but that means a lot to me now. Yeah. Well, you were the last, last guys in the field, really. Right. And getting out there at that point. Uh, now, you mentioned, were you just carrying somebody else's radio at that point? Yeah. Okay, so you hadn't been an RTO or anything yourself? No, no. Okay. Uh, I had my rifle, which I'd carried. And when uh, they were loading us onto the choppers, uh, Whoever was loading us said, "We need you to carry equipment back. Here's mm -hmm. a radio." Okay. All right. Now, did you have to go get treatment for your arm wound, or was that? Um, yeah. I first thing I did was take a shower, and then uh, went over to the aid station to get my arm treated. And they looked mm -hmm. at it and said, "We can't treat that there. It's it's too serious. You'll have to go over to the uh, field hospital." Mm -hmm. So I went over to the field hospital and I looked at it and says. Oh no, we, we can't treat that. We only treat the serious stuff. Go to your aid station. <laughs> and he says, I just came from there. They sent me over here. And he says, well, you have to go to Fu by then. And uh, they told me how to, where, where I could get a, a chopper to go on out there. And I went, got on the helicopter, went to uh, Fu by at the hospital. Uh, doctor did a debridement there. It was infected already. Mm -hmm. And he did a debridement bandaged up, got infected again, uh, got that infection cleaned up, they put stitches in it, and uh, it got infected a couple of times and the stitches tore out. And they got it cleaned up again and stitched it up again and those stitches tore out. I ended up spending over 70 days in hospitals. Wow. And how are you spending your time all that time? Did you have anything to do? Uh, oh yeah. Uh, they always had work details. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of it was just make do work, but uh, they didn't let you lay around. You know, if, if you were physically able, you were up and doing something. Do you suppose they had anything to do with the stitches pulling out? You had to move the arm? Uh, I'm not sure. All right. Uh, but you kind of, now, uh, the hospital facility itself, I mean, how civilized was that relative to what you were used to? I, I was in a number of different hospitals. Okay. Uh, I thought I was in uh, the one in Fubai for a week. Mm -hmm. But uh, recently I was going through some papers and found orders moving me to a different hospital on the 24th. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Uh, I guess they were okay. I spent almost a week in an Air Force hospital, which was unbelievably nice. Mm -hmm. Ended up at uh, Six uh, Convalescent Center in Cameron Bay. Okay. Now, once you get through with all of that, do they send you back to your company? Yes. Okay. Uh, so when did you get back to them? Um, I'm not sure. So you said it 70 was days, 70 so that's going to you August, September, maybe into October or something? Yeah, I, I think October, November. Okay. And when you got back, did you know anybody there? Didn't know anybody. you hadn't gotten to know them too well in the first place. Right. I didn't know anybody except the guys I went in with. Mm -hmm. uh, the company clerk I knew, he, was, he came in the same time I did. And mm -hmm. 
managed to get to be a company clerk, so I knew him, but nobody else. Okay. And what was the company doing then? They were out in the field. Okay. They were doing their patrolling thing out in the field. Uh, Top Ross was there. He sent me to uh, marksmanship school for a week. And then the uh, company came in for a stand down. And I went back out with them when they went out back out to the field. Mm -hmm. And was there much happening in the field now? No. So you were just walking around in the jungle from one place to another and then going yeah, off? Pretty much, yeah. Uh, you know, we found bunkers and this and that. But uh, as I, I don't recall any firefights. Okay. And then how long did this go on? That lasted until, I'm thinking, around February. Okay. And uh, the policy was to take the shortest people out of the field and put them on the perimeter guard at Camp Evans. Mm -hmm. And at February, I was one of those shortest people. So I went to the rear, spent the rest of my tour on the perimeter. Okay. Now, what was life like uh, on a base camp rather than out in the field? What was different about it? Well, you had a, uh, a hooch to sleep in. You had to share it with everybody. But, uh, well, no, it didn't actually have the hooch to sleep in. There was a hooch there. Uh, that night, though, you were in a bunker on the, on the line, uh, four hours on, four hours off. You had a, a buddy who was in the same bunker with you. Uh, so worked half the night and worked half a day. Mm -hmm. okay. um, now. Some of this, there's a certain sets of stereotypes and things about Vietnam and things that go on. And one of them has to do with, with drug use and that kind of thing, particularly in rear areas and base camps. Did you notice that kind of thing when you were on Evans? Yeah. Um, there was, it was rampant. Uh, lots of marijuana, lots of heroin. Out in the field, though, nobody would uh, consider. Mm -hmm. As far as I know, nobody would consider having drugs out there. Right. Then did the heroin create incidents or, or problems on the base while you were there? I mean, did, were there guys who would either OD or just act strangely? Uh, not, not that I know. There was one guy, our sergeant, one of the sergeants on the line, who was uh, really addicted to the heroin. Mm -hmm. And he got a little freaky every once in a while, but not out of hand. Okay. Another stereotype has to do with race relations. I mean, was there a divide between black soldiers and white yeah, ones? There was a huge divide. Um, out on the out on the uh, the perimeter, on the bunker line, it wasn't too bad because most of us had been out in the field together. Mm -hmm. But once you get back to the company area where the mess hall was, and uh, all the guys who had never been out to the field, you know, the cooks, the laundry, mm -hmm. maintenance, all of that, it was, it was a huge divide. It was, it was us and them. Mm -hmm. And uh, they made no bones about it, and we made no bones about it. But were there fights, or is just just tension? There was a lot of tension, um, a lot of a lot of disrespect back and forth. Mm -hmm. Like uh, one of the things that uh, the blacks did was a chow line. They'd have one person go out there, get in the front of the line, and then everybody else would go out and join them. And. Uh, no fights ever happened. I'm not sure why, but there was there were never any fights. But that it created a lot of tension. Mm -hmm. And then, how long did you spend there? Until uh, mid June. Okay. Now, uh, you had your tour sort of interrupted by all the time in the hospital and so forth. Were you able to take an R and R at some point? Uh, I would have been able to, but I declined to. Okay. Uh, I wanted to save the money. All right. Uh, 
And did you do any in-country R&R or anything like that? Or? Uh, well, when, when I first got back to the company, we had that uh, stand down, and later we had a stand down at uh, Eagle Beach. Mm -hmm. And what was there? There, the there was there was lots of lots of girls, uh, lots of booze, and uh, there were the girls in the USO show. Now, were they American girls, or were they from the Philippines, or they were uh, Filipinos? I think there might have been some Americans there, but mm -hmm. mostly Filipinos. And it was just let our hair down and go wild. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, now, you get down to the end of the enlistment, did you know in advance when you were leaving, or did someone just have to tell you someday? Um, we had uh, estimated times of departure, and at the time I was getting out, they had, uh, they were doing early outs. And I was hoping to get out like six weeks early. Mm -hmm. Didn't happen. It, it kept uh, going. Uh, hold on a second. Mm -hmm. Let me get rid of this phone. Uh, they kept uh, the early out kept getting shorter and shorter time. I ended up only two weeks early. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, three or four days before I actually left, I knew I was going to. Okay. Uh, what, before we take you out of Vietnam, what kind of impression did you have of the Vietnamese people themselves? I mean, in what contexts did you see them, and what view did you have of them at the time? Um, well, when uh, we uh, when I first came in, and we were in the trucks coming up to Evans. Uh, the impression I got was they were just people doing their everyday stuff. Mm -hmm. the, um, I never got any uh, contact on the base camp with the Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. uh, every once in a while we'd go out on patrols after I was in the rear on the, on the perimeter and they'd be wanting to sell us everything, mm -hmm. you know, gold and marijuana and whatever, and they just seemed like greedy people, mm -hmm. but still just people. Yeah, they were trying to survive and that was what was available. Right. Yeah. All right. Uh, did you ever see anything of the Vietnamese military? No. Okay. Uh, so now it's your turn to get out. Um, where do you fly out from? Uh, where did we go? I think that was back to Cameron Bay, when, where we flew out of, and uh, we were in roach-infested uh, barracks, and huge roaches, and uh, we just stayed there until, you know, they says, okay, it's your turn to, to go out to the plane. We had to set our, our luggage out and let the dog sniff it, and then on the plane, and Mm -hmm. Back home. All right. Uh, now, where did you land in the States? Fort Lewis. Okay, you go back to Fort Lewis again. Uh, and what do they do with you when you, you get there? How, what's the out-processing like? Uh, they made sure we had uh, new uniforms, uh, khakis. Uh, made sure we had all the medals we, we were supposed to have. Gave us a short in-speech, uh, in-country speech. You know, what do they want you to know? They wanted to be sure we didn't have our sleeves rolled up and to flush the toilets and, you know, stuff like that. All right. Uh, and now, did they, they say anything to you about the trip home? Or should you wear your uniform or civilian clothes? They talk about protesters or...? They didn't talk about protesters. Uh, they told us that uh, we could get a military hop, uh, but we had to be in... Uh, uniform to do that. Mm -hmm. We could get uh, standby on uh, commercial airlines, but we had to be in uniform for that. 
So I wore my uniform back. Okay. And did you have any trouble on the way home? No, I didn't. Okay. Uh, we got into uh, Stapleton International Airport in Denver. Somebody picked me up there. Okay. Now that you're back uh, in the States, now what do you do? You go back to school or go to work or what? Uh, well, I still had some, about six months to do in the military. Okay. Uh, got a 30 day leave. Uh, spent about all the money I had saved up then. And then went to Fort Riley okay. for, for the rest of my tour. They didn't need any infantry, so they put me in the MPs. All right. That's in Kansas. Right? That's in Kansas. Okay. Yes. And the, originally, the big cavalry base was what it was. But, yeah. Uh, so uh, I don't know how much business did you have as an MP? What were you spending your time doing? Uh, mostly riding around in the jeep or, or standing at the gate. It was uh, pretty simple. Mm -hmm. A couple of times there were complaints we had to, to take care of, but. Yeah. Were there many troops on the base, or were most people someplace else? Uh, well, when I first got there, uh, the base was practically empty because they were uh, out, I think, Michigan, because of protest, mm -hmm. and they were uh, doing security there. But uh, when that was over, it was everybody was there. Mm -hmm. And do you know what unit was based there? Uh, there was an infantry unit there. I was with uh, 5th Army MPs. Okay. All right. Uh, and then did you just live on base and have this like a just a, just a regular eight-hour-a-day job? Yeah. 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 Uh, it was shift work, of course, since it was MP. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I lived on base in the barracks. And and did the people on the base basically behave themselves? Did you mean, as opposed to having a lot of troubles or misconduct from the soldiers or things like that? No, no there wasn't really anything. There was uh, the two incidences were theft. And, you know, somebody stole something and they mm -hmm. wanted us to investigate it. Yeah, so pretty quiet. Yeah. Did anybody make any effort to encourage you to re enlist, or were they just trying to get rid of people by then? Uh, they made no effort to re-enlist me. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when do you finally get out? That was in October, um, early October, but I'm not sure of the date. Yeah, of 71? 71. 71, yes. Okay, uh, and now once you're out, what do you do? Uh, well, I moved back to Boulder. Well, I moved to Boulder. I was in the Springs, Colorado Springs and uh, start looking for a job. Okay. Work was hard to find. So how long did it take you to find a job? It took me a couple of months anyway. Okay. And then what kind of work did you get? Uh, first job I got uh, after I was out, I was security guard, mm -hmm. night security guard. And did you stay with that or move on to something else? Uh, well, I uh, fell off the roof of a three-story building, so okay. after that I moved on to something else. All right, so what did you wind up doing eventually? Um, in Boulder, I'm not sure. My, uh, my parents had a uh, remodeling business in Colorado Springs. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I was looking for work then, and they said, well, come on down and, and uh, you know, work for us. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll treat you right. So that's what I did. Okay. And you're still in Colorado Springs today? I'm still in Colorado Springs. All right. Um, how hard was it to adjust to civilian life after being in the military? Uh, it was, it took me a while. Uh, especially that first Fourth of July. That was, that was a tough one. And, uh, I don't know, I didn't think I changed, but everybody said I had. Mm hmm Right. Uh, did you, I mean, the, 
Fourth of July, it's like the hearing and certain kinds of noises that that's the, the reflex response to, to things. Right. And that's that's sort of one piece of what gets labeled as PTSD uh, and so forth. Um, did you have other issues that, that created real problems for you, or? Uh, yeah, uh, sleeping was difficult. Lots of nightmares. Um, one night I was having nightmares, and my wife woke me up. And I punched her. And yeah, there was there were some problems with that. Did you eventually get treatment or support, or just get through them, or? Uh, years and years later, it was uh, only like five years ago or so, I, I finally started getting treatment for it. Mm -hmm. uh, has that done you any good? Yeah, it has. Right. Uh, now, on the other side of it, do you think that you got anything positive out of the time in the Army? Uh, well, I get disability every month, but I'm not sure it was worth it. Uh, there's not really a whole lot of positive that I can think of that I got out of the Army. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, how did you wind up uh, coming to Ripcord reunions? Well, nobody had ever heard of Ripcord. Uh, I tried to talk to several people about it and ask them, you know, about if they ever heard about it. Nobody did. And uh, one day uh, I picked up a book in, on the bargain bookshelf about helicopter warfare, and lo and behold, there was one paragraph that talked about Ripcord. Mm -hmm. And by that time there was internet, and I said, "Okay, I can I can look for this." And found the Ripcord Association. Mm -hmm. All right, and have you now sort of connected with people in a way you hadn't when you were with the unit, or how does that work for yeah. you? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. There's uh, uh, Dave Yance is uh, a good friend. Mm -hmm. well, we came in together. He went to Ripcord. I went to the company, and okay. we, we've connected. Uh, Lee, I know of course, mm -hmm. and, and some of the others. All right, and what's good about coming here? What what benefits does that bring? Uh, it's good because I know that what I remember is actually real. Mm -hmm. um, I've been told once before when I was trying to talk about it, and somebody was telling me, "Well, I'm sure it was. It seems worse than it really was." And. You know, by the time I found this, I was thinking, well, maybe I just made all that up. So, yeah, it's, it's good to know that's real. Yeah, and, and you went into that. I mean, a, a company ordeal on the 22nd, 23rd is one of the more in, in, intense things that I learned about talking to a lot of Vietnam veterans. And you got that with virtually no field experience or anything else. Yeah. So that would make a pretty powerful impression. But you didn't have anything else to compare it to, really. Right. I, th I thought that was just normal warfare. Mm -hmm. that, that's how it was supposed to be. That's how it was in, in all the movies for World War II. Sure. Yeah, and I guess, and in general, I guess, and in the rest of society, when you're, gonna go, when you're back in the civilian life and everything else like that, did you talk much about being in Vietnam? Did anyone ask you, or did that just get put aside? No. Um, I found rather quickly that it was best just to pretend that I've not been in the service, let alone Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, I didn't say anything about it. And how do you uh, view now the way people treat veterans? Because we've always guys coming back from Iraq and yeah. Afghanistan. Um, what do you think? Is it better for them now? Yes, I'm, I'm glad that people welcome them back, uh, thank them for their service. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I'd just like to close here by thanking you for taking the time to share the story today. Yeah, no problem. All right.